I am so pleased to be able to introduce Troy to you today. I want you to take note, I think you've probably seen with a lot of the entrepreneurs who, come, who have come and spoken to you already, that the difference between entrepreneurs and people who aren't entrepreneurs are that the people who are entrepreneurs do something. And I think that's definitely the case with Tori. Um, I've been following her business since she started it here in St. Pete. And I think a lot of people would have said, oh, I don't have all the right resources. I don't have everything that I want, how I want it. And Tori just did it. So instead of waiting around for everything to be perfect. So please pay special attention to Tori today. Um, Tori Meidel is the founder and co-owner of Dreammaker Flower Farm, a small scale cut flower farm she started in her half acre backyard in 2021 with the help of her husband, Matt. Dreammaker Flower Farm provides unique seasonal blooms from April through September, which are sold via social media and at local farmers markets. And the mission of the farm is to make cut flowers an everyday pleasure that's affordable for everyone, not a rare expense reserved only for special events. Before starting the flower farm, Tori graduated from Utah State University with her degree in English and psychology and taught seventh grade for four years in Box Elder County before quitting to stay at home with her children. So please welcome Tori. Okay, thanks for the introduction, Tara Lee. Um, so first of all, who are we? Um, like she said, my name is Tori, um, and my husband's name is Matt. We have three kids. My oldest daughter is Raven, she's six. I have a son, Matthias, who's three, and then my youngest is two. Um, so I used to teach English and Spanish, basically, up in Tremont at just a middle school, and I quit to stay at home with my kids. and. I love being a stay-at-home mom, um, but I've always been the kind of person that I just like to have a lot of hobbies. I like to have a lot of stuff going on. And so we lived, used to live in an apartment, and people always wondered kind of, how did you go from teaching to farming? They're very different things. I grew up very cerebral. I like reading. I have a blog about reading. I love writing. And so it's very different worlds, and it's kind of funny how we got into it. So we used to live in an apartment, and when I quit to stay at home with my daughter, we had a really hard year in my family in 2017. We had a lot of really hard things happen. I was dealing with pretty intense anxiety, and I just wanted to be able to do something different. I needed a change in my life, and so we decided, we hadn't planned on buying a home yet, but we decided, you know what? We've saved up some money. We've been in an apartment for six years. Let's buy a home. So we bought our first home, and to help with my anxiety, I started gardening. And I discovered, you know what, this is awesome. I actually really love this. And then the second year that we were in our home, I heard about this thing called cut flower gardening, which is where you grow flowers solely for the purpose of cutting them to bring inside. And I thought, I like flowers. They're usually too expensive to buy anywhere else. I'm just going to grow my own. And from that first packet of Snapdragon seeds that I successfully grew myself, I was totally hooked. I was totally hooked on the growing process. Um, fast forward a couple years, my husband's company that he works for, they were going to relocate to Ephraim. Um, this happened in 2020. We learned about this literally about two weeks after the pandemic hit. It was pandemic hit and then all of a sudden we're going to move from Cache Valley where we had been living to Sand Pete, which I'm not familiar with this area at all. And so we looked around for houses, um, and we ended up found, finding a house in Manti on a half acre. The house is just okay. It was totally the yard that won me over. And half acre was like a dream for me. We'd only been on about a quarter of an acre in a suburban lot in Cache Valley, so half acre seemed huge. So what did I do? I sunk hundreds of dollars into cut flower seeds. And I realized, wow, this actually is a lot of money because we're gonna be building nine raised garden beds and I need all this soil and I had all these seeds and before I realized it, I'd literally sunk thousands of dollars into my hobby. And so what happened is I'd heard about some people selling cut flowers like as a business and even here in Utah and I thought maybe I should just go for it and maybe I should just go for it and see if there's a market for it and honestly at first the very beginning, I only wanted to recoup some of my own costs. And then all of a sudden, I realized I'm tapping into a market that there's actually a real need for. And before I knew it, the business had grown 
to be much more than just a little side hobby. And now I would consider it to be pretty close to a full-time job during the growing season. So we grow in our backyard. My business is in my own backyard. Uh, this is a picture of my very weed-ridden raised garden bed area last year in about August. Um, we just grow all the flowers in beds. Um, and we bundle them up, as you can see, in just hand-tied market bouquets, just in brown craft paper um, with a ribbon around it. It has our business logo and sticker. And we basically sell three ways. I sell in what's called a CSA bouquet subscription, which is where you can pay us up front for a certain number of bouquets um, throughout our whole growing season. And you get a bouquet either once a month or once every two weeks through the whole growing season. Um, and that helps with spring costs of the farm. We also sell via social media. So if you were to go on Facebook or Instagram and look up Dreamaker Flower Farm, I do pop-up sales. And so you could see, hey, these are the bouquets I have um, available this week, and you could snag one for yourself. And hint, they're very affordable. So if you're looking to impress a date, this is much more affordable than anything you're going to find from a florist and way better than anything you're going to find at Walmart. So. Um, and then the third thing is that we sold at the Manti Farmers Market last year. So I learned a ton of things in my first year in business. So we're just going to go through these lessons. Um, some of them I learned the hard way. So my first lesson that I learned is you have to treat your business like a business from the get-go. Um, I've done other businesses before, but they were businesses that I basically fell into. Um, like I mentioned before, I have a blog. I blog for fun. I love to write. I love to read. I love to talk about things that interest me, and so why not blog? And so I started to blog over 10 years ago, and I fell into making money from it. Not a ton of money, but it was just something that kind of happened. Then I took photographs from my blog, so I kind of fell into photography, and then I started getting better at photography, and all of a sudden people were saying, hey, how much do you charge? Me charge for photography? And so I kind of fell into photography, and I didn't really ever treat it like a business. Sure, I still grew from year to year in my photography. I still had more clients from year to year, but it wasn't something I ever really treated as, well, it's just like this hobby that kind of makes me money. It was never something that I treated from the beginning like a business. I was never serious about it. But with this, I decided, you know what? I'm just going to treat it like a business from the beginning. And it made all the difference in the world. So that meant from the beginning, I thought whenever I came across an issue, I had to think not how I would handle this as just somebody making money off of a hobby. You know, I had to think, how would a business owner do this? How would an established cut flower farmer do this? And I'll give you an example. So I had a bouquet making night. Um, I had people come over to my home, and I was teaching them how to assemble bouquets and you know, how to make it visually appealing. And then you know, they got to take it home after. And so we had this bouquet making night. And one of the attendees was saying, you know what, I'm having a really hard time getting childcare. Can I bring my kid? OK, as a person, I'm like, I'm a mom. I don't care if there's kids there. Whatever, but like my own kids were not in the home. My husband was taking my kids somewhere else so that it could be more of a professional environment that people wanted to go to without kids screaming everywhere. So I'm like, you know what? I had to tell her, even though we were friends, I knew her. I said, you know what? This is adults only. There's no kids. And I had to think, that's how a real business owner would have handled it. You wouldn't have asked a real business thing like, can I bring my kid? And so you just have to think about things. How would an established business handle this? And it really helped me through a lot of tricky situations. Um, it also is big to put up a professional front from the beginning. You know, you might not have a lot of money at the, up front, but make sure that you've designed a logo. Make sure that you've actually thought through a business name. Make sure you've reserved your social media pages, even if you end up never using them. Make sure they're at least reserved for you to have in the future. Um, those were all things that I'm really glad I did at the beginning, because as I saw the need for what I was doing and my market all of a sudden got a lot bigger, I was glad I already had all that stuff in place. Um, plus, do not forget to keep track of your income and expenses for taxes. And I did this from the beginning because I had been burned on my photography business by not keeping very good track of my expenses, especially my driving expenses. Now every year I know January 1st, go out and check the odometer on my car. December 31st, check it again because you can write off business miles and so I had to, you know, and there's apps you can do for that as well. Treat it like a business from the beginning. Okay, 
Second thing I learned, you have to research and maybe rethink who your target customer is. So, raise your hand if you have bought flowers in the last year. Okay. So, um, raise your hand if, so, so keep your hands up if you bought flowers in the last year. Keep your hand up if those flowers were from Walmart. Keep them up, if, so okay, raise your hand if the flowers are from a florist. Okay, and then anyone else buy flowers from anyone else in the last year? Besides you. <laughs> Where'd you buy your flowers? Costco. Costco, okay, so like another like Costco or Sam's Club. Okay, so here in San Pete, we do not have much of an, like a place that you can go to for cut flowers. You can either go to a florist and spend 50, 60 bucks on a small arrangement, or you can go to Walmart and spend five to 20 bucks on flowers that depending on when they come, may look a little scary or not, you know, not be what you want. Okay, so what I all of a sudden realized, I am hitting a market that there's a really big price jump between 20 bucks and 60 bucks. And I'm also providing something that's totally unique. It's local, it's sustainably grown. And so, you know what, I offer my hand tied bouquets for 20 bucks. The most expensive one I've offered is, was for 30 bucks. And so I have this, this market right in the middle where you can buy something much more special than you could at Walmart, but you're not gonna be forking over all the money you're gonna pay for a, a florist. And so I'm hitting that sweet spot in the middle. So the reason why I bring this up is because when I did my business plan, because I did come up with a business plan, I thought I was gonna have two customers. I thought I was gonna have CSA customers, so the people who had bought their bouquets from me up front at the beginning of the season, and then I figured, okay, they're my first priority. They always were. And then the next priority I thought was going to be I was gonna to sell to florists because I could sell my blooms wholesale to florists. And then I figured if I have anything left over, then I can sell to the public. Then I can do pop-up sales on social media. Okay, problem. I didn't know what a florist wanted, okay? I happen to have a neighbor that is now a friend who is a florist, okay? She owns the Tilted Tulip here in Ephraim. And so I was talking to her and she was interested because I even said, hey, I'm growing flowers. Would you be interested in buying flowers for me? And she said, absolutely I would because she's gonna get better quality because it's not shipped halfway across the world. And she's also going to, and they're not gonna be, you know, out of water for weeks. And so they're gonna last longer. Um, my bouquets, I've had some people tell me my bouquets last almost a month. And so, I mean, they just last longer. They're better quality. My florist was absolutely interested. So she calls me up and she says, hey, Tori, I'm doing a funeral. It's really last minute. My wholesaler in Provo, you know, I'd rather go through you first. I need these specific things. And she started listing specific flowers in specific quantities. And all of a sudden I realized, oh, shoot, I didn't plant for a florist at all. I planted mostly mixes of colors because I was thinking for myself, oh, my CSA customers, they're gonna want mixes of flowers. I'm gonna wanna play with different mixes of flowers. I hadn't planned on what a florist wanted. A florist wants vast quantities of the same thing. Had not planned on it at all. So this year, because my florist is still interested, I've done things differently. Now, um, I'm growing a crop called Ranunculus this year, and it's a very high value crop. You can sell it for a lot of money. And I'm planting a lot of it. I'm planting, you know, 100 plants that will give me just white ranunculus. I'm planting 100 that will just give me red, 100 that will give me yellow. And that way, when they all come on, I can bring her a bucket of 100 blooms and say, hey, are you interested now? Because she needs quantity in the same color. So think about how, um, do you know what your target customer is actually wanting or looking for? Um, what is the price range your target customer is willing to pay? and how will your target customer find you? And so this is where I had to really rethink, you know, things like on social media, like, okay, how are they gonna find me on social media? Because that's mainly how I'm doing my marketing. Um, and so I had to think about all these things, and then the last thing is, you know, what need are you fulfilling? If you're not fulfilling a need for somebody, you're not gonna be in business for very long. And so that was the big thing I had to realize, is I have to fulfill a need. Okay. Plan three, be flexible. You gotta plan your business plan changing over time. I already kind of mentioned this with the florist thing, um, but I'll use another example. I hadn't planned on selling at the farmer's market at all, um, and that was never part of my business plan. I didn't wanna like give up all my Saturdays, nothing like that. 
Um, and then the owner of the, or the person who started up the Manti um, farmer's market actually came to my door personally one night. He knocked on my door and he said, hey, I'm Hunter. I run the you know, Manti farmer's market. People are requesting that we have someone that sells flowers here. There's no one else around here that does what you're doing. Will you please consider coming? And then all of a sudden I realized, hmm, it's only $5 a vendor to join, which a lot of farmer's markets, you know, you're gonna be paying 40, 50 bucks a time at least to join or like pay up front for the whole season, hundreds of dollars in fees. So five bucks a week to go and like, you don't have to like sign a contract or like submit a whole bunch of stuff. I'm like, okay. So I'm like, and it only runs for, I think five or six weeks. So why not? I can do it for five or six Saturdays. And so we went to the farmer's market and it ended up being a really great venue because it was a way to get rid of a whole lot of extra flowers that we had because we were getting so much in August that we couldn't sell that many you know, via social media, at least not as with how small we still were. So it was a great way to sell off more flowers. It also was a way to hit people that aren't, are not on social media. There's a lot of people who don't use social media. So it was a great way for me to have a whole new demographic who came to the farmer's market, had never heard of us. And so they were able to sell or to buy our things there. Um, so just different things you had to be flexible on, you know, marketing. You got to think like, does your marketing match with your target customer? And that might have to change over time depending on like the response you get and things like that. All right. Um, Lesson four, sometimes you have to be willing to just pay for the results. Um, and everything always costs more than you think it will. So something that I really, I love the word free. I'm like, I'm like anyone, right? I love things that are free. And I'm a, also a really hard worker and I'm really good at studying and researching and doing stuff on my own. And so I was thinking, you know what? There's so much I can do that I don't have to pay for. There's all these super expensive classes you can take on cut flower farming. If you guys have ever heard of Florette Farm, you know, you can take her cut flower form, farming course online for 2,000 bucks. You know, there's another one you can take for around 600 bucks. I didn't want to pay 2,000 bucks. So I'm like, you know what, there's things I can do on my own, I can research on my own. However, I also realized there's some things that it is worth shelling out money for because it'll either save you a ton of time, um, it'll make you get way better results. Um, an example of this is on social media. If you are marketing on social media, you have to realize there's really only so much you can do to get organic growth on social media. Sure, you can be posting several times a day, you can be using all the hashtags, you can be researching popular hashtags, things like that. The only problem is, is yeah, some of your algorithms, you'll hit the right algorithm and it'll go to a lot of people. But for something like my CSA subscriptions, I couldn't just take a chance that Facebook would show it to the right people who had never seen my page, who had never heard of us. Last year we were totally unknown, totally untried. I had never flower farmed in my life before. And so I had to make sure that we actually got it out to the people who could maybe you know, wanna buy from us. And so I did pay for Facebook and Instagram ads. And so I paid 20 bucks for a Facebook ad for our CSA subscriptions last year. Within like the first hour of that ad going live, I already sold you know, three or four subscriptions totaling several hundred dollars. Well worth, well worth the expense. And so sometimes you just have to be willing to pay for results. Yeah, sometimes you can put in the sweat equity and save yourself the money, sometimes you can't. Um, and also, like I said up here, just count on everything costing about double or triple what you think. So, um, lesson five is you have to think of your brand and your overall vision and you have to stick with it. Um, so my brand or my vision is to make flowers more affordable for everyone. I don't want people to save flowers for a funeral or for just a wedding or for something super big and special. I want people to think, you know what, flowers are something that I can do just because or I can just buy in my home and enjoy them in my home just because or, you know, somebody got a promotion, let's just get them flowers and it's not going to, you know, break my budget so I can just get them. You know, I, I want it to become a thing where people don't have to, Think of them as this big special occasion thing. However, that means that I also have to think as a business owner of the things on my end. So if I'm gonna be selling bouquets at a price point of 20, 20 bucks, you know, I have to make sure that I'm not giving away flowers in that bouquet that are worth a lot more if I were to sell them to a florist. So for example, for Mother's Day this year, I'm offering special Mother's Day bouquets that are gonna cost 30, 
And they're going to cost 30 because they have ranunculus in them, which, as I already said, is a very high value crop. It's a flower that's worth a lot of money. And so I have to think about, you know, with my, with my brand, with my thing, if I'm going to stay in that price point, it means that I can't be growing the craziest, most expensive things unless I'm willing to push up my price point on those things. And to hit my target customer, I have to try to keep things lower. So that means, you know, growing a lot of crops that are really highly productive, but don't cost me much money to grow them, such as zinnias and snapdragons, okay? They're easy to grow, they produce a ton, but they don't cost me a ton of money to grow them. All right, um, lesson six, you gotta under-promise and over-deliver. <laughs> this is a big mistake I made last year. So, you look at these pictures and you see the, all of these beautiful blooms. If you look on the left, that is my kitchen. Those are buckets of flowers. It looks like I have a ver you know, veritable abundance of more than enough for CSA customers. What actually happened was I did a CSA subscription without ever knowing exactly when certain things bloomed here in San Pete and without having a lot of bulbs like tulips or anything in my own yard. So what happened is I just looked at the days to maturity on the seed packet and I was thinking, based on the days to maturity, all of these plants should be ready by May when I need them for my CSA customers. What actually happened, nothing was ready in May. I had no flowers in May. And Tara Lee's gonna laugh because she got one of these May bouquets. She actually got two May bouquets. <laughs> so the funny thing is, is we only had May bouquets by a, an absolute miracle. <laughs> and it's because I, my mom used to work for somebody who um, his sister ended up passing away. And his sister lived in Salt Lake City, who are a growing zone higher than ours. They're warmer. They have a longer growing season than we do. Anyway, it just so happened that she used to be a florist. And she used to have a lot of stuff in her own yard that she had planted for cutting. And they were just going to sell her home. And the yard had just been left to go crazy because she hadn't been able to keep up with it in her older years. And so my mom's you know, friend or whatever, she, he said, you know, your daughter is welcome to whatever she wants from that yard. That is the only reason I was able to fulfill those May subscriptions. I didn't grow any of those, except for the spirea, which is the fluffy white looking one, that and the lilacs. Those did come from my yard. Everything else was from this other yard. It was by a sheer miracle that we were able to make it happen. That was a big mistake on my part. For anyone else looking to flower farming, I'd say don't do a CSA subscription your first year. It was, it was really stressful. Then in June, when I started to actually have flowers, I didn't realize you know, how much stuff still didn't, it just takes longer than you think it will. And if you remember, last June we had a crazy heat wave, like the first week of June for like a week where it was like 100 degrees. Every, it ruined my plants. Everything that should have been blooming like this tall bloomed this tall. I couldn't use it. And so once again, I was struggling to find flowers. I didn't have access to that yard anymore. And so I had to contact every single CSA member who should have received two bouquets. And I said, I'm really sorry. You're only going to receive one this month, and I'm just going to make it up in August, which I did. But it was still embarrassing because, you know, I was, I was supposed to be delivering every two weeks. And it was just because I didn't know. You know, I didn't know what grew when. And so I've made sure to take very good records about what blooms when, just so I know. But, you know, I've learned from this, you know, don't be afraid to ask for help. When I realized that I was getting pretty desperate in May, I started talking to a lot of people, you know, talking to a lot of people. Do you know anyone that has flowers in their yard? They wouldn't mind me cutting. You know, I started talking to people. And then in June, when I realized I am literally not going to have enough flowers, I just had to fess up and say, you know what, I'm really sorry. I am just not going to have enough. Or I also told them, and this is going to be the smallest bouquet you're going to get the whole year. And then this year, you better believe I have planned so much better for May and June. I planted around 3,000 bulbs in October. And then I also have a high tunnel now, so now I can produce in June more easily. And you have to learn from your mistakes, because otherwise we're not going to stay in business for very long. OK, number seven is never underestimate the power of word of mouth, including from yourself. So you have to just be willing to talk to people no matter where you are, it can be really awkward at first. Trust me, you probably will feel like a fake. You will feel like a phony and like you're making it all up as you go along. But guess what? Everyone else was there too at some point. And so you just talk to everybody. Um, and eventually, if you sell a good enough product or service, your customers are going to do your talking for you. And that's where we're getting at to be this year, where they're starting to do the talking for us and we're getting referrals through other people. 
Okay, number eight is don't undervalue your time. I offered free deliveries last year. Big mistake. I lost so much money doing free deliveries because when I'm delivering all over the place, you know, that's hours and hours of my own time that I was undervaluing. So this year, I decided, you know, with the CSA subscriptions, I can't offer free delivery. I have to charge for delivery because that's my gas time. That's time, you know, that I have to pack my kids into the car, that we have to, like, go somewhere and, like, spend hours in deliveries. You know, that's time. And so you have to think, how much time does everything cost? And, you know, am I paying myself anything for that time? And then how do you include that in the cost of your product or service? So I'm going to have to go fast here just because I want to leave time for questions. Um, number nine, print business cards. I didn't print business cards last year. I thought that business cards were a thing of the past. I thought, we live in a paperless world. Who asks for business cards? Guess what? A ton of people still ask for business cards. I, there were so many sales I could have made last year that I didn't make because I didn't have them. By the way, if you want our business card, it's right here. It has our social media on it. It has my um, contact information on it. Um, but that was just a big mistake that I made. It was just a really stupid mistake. They only cost like 40 bucks for like 300. So get your business cards. Especially because my business is out of my house. It's not like I have a storefront that people can just show up at. You know, they have to actually contact me directly before that point. And so it's really important for me to have a way to just tell, tell people like, hey, this is how you can contact me. Okay, the last lesson is paying it forward is not only a really rewarding thing to do in and of itself, but it actually is a really good business strategy. So we would always wanted this to be a way for us to be able to give flowers to people who needed them. That was always going to be a part of our business plan. But last year, we ended up getting a really generous donation from a family member, and she said, I want you to use this money to just give bouquets to people in need. And so what we did is using that money, I then got on social media and I put out a post on one of the community pages and I said, hey, we have free bouquets that we can give to people in need. If you know of somebody who's struggling, who's lonely, who's dealing with mental health struggles, please message me their name and their address and we will take them flowers. And by the way, we're doing that this year too. So if you know of somebody who is in need and who could use flowers from April to September, don't hesitate to contact us because now we actually got three donors this year who paid us money that we could do pay it forward bouquets. And so we delivered in like 25 or 30 bouquets last year to people who were in need, who were struggling. And not only was it incredibly rewarding, because how fun is it to go up to somebody and just hand them flowers when they didn't expect it, but that actually ended up bringing in so much business. Because people want to support a business that's good, that does good things in the world. And so people said, you know what? You did that for my mother-in-law. You took my mother-in-law flowers. I want, to, I want to support you. I'm going to buy flowers from you for somebody else. One of the people that we delivered a bouquet to last year ended up being a CSA subscriber this year. She's barely bought a subscription from us two weeks ago. And so you just never know what kind of impact that can have. But it definitely, you don't lose anything by being generous. And that was a big lesson for me because we got a lot of business last year from, from those pay it forward bouquets that we were given. So that is my presentation. I want to go ahead and, you know, open the floor. If you guys have any questions for me, I'm more than happy to answer them. So go ahead. So we do sustainable farming methods, so we don't use pesticides um, or anything like that. So the, way, the best way to protect, your, to protect your stuff if you're doing it that way is to have really good soil because a healthy plant is a much more effective way to ward off many diseases because it's healthy. And then if you attract enough beneficial insects, those beneficial insects usually keep all of your pests in control. So I'm sure as years go on, we will deal with more pest issues. And we did have a little bit of insect damage on some of our things for sure. Um, but for the most part, we were attracting so many good insects into our yard with just all of the flowers that, I mean, the bad insects, they didn't stay around for too long. I mean, we had a lot of really beneficial insects around. Go ahead. So this might not apply to everyone in the room, but there are probably a lot of people that are wanting to stay home. And, and if they are going to have a business, it's going to have to be from home. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so what, were, what are some tips that you would give to people who are specifically looking to be stay-at-home parents or stay home for some reason and yet still run a business? I mean, it's just kind of just like with anything else. I mean, it is going to take time. You're going to have to look at where you can take time. And there's also seasons of life. Um, there are certain seasons that it's going to be extremely hard to do it from home. Not impossible, but you might have to call in extra help with childcare. 
Um, I've been really fortunate in that we haven't had to call an extra helpless child care because my husband's job that he works at is flexible enough um, just because he's a manager. And so he's, he's free to, it's like right now, he's home with our kids right now. And so he's free to kind of take off time and make it up when he needs to do a more flexible schedule. But I mean, you do have to think if you're going to stay at home, you know, what sacrifices are you willing to make? What sacrifices are you not willing to make? And my kids are super involved. I mean, this is in our backyard. I say, kids, let's go on back. They run around, they play, they help with a ton of this. They help plant the stuff. They help me with harvesting. They help me with putting the stuff together. And I mean, kids are eager to help. Um, and they're, you know, for me, it's just, I have, I'm lucky that it's just right there and they can, they can be a part of it without really hindering too much, we, we could say. And so it's just like with anything, there's always gonna be trade-offs um, and you might have to call and help with childcare. I mean, that's just the, the fact of it. Let's go ahead. What's the most popular flower I sell? Um, we do mixed bouquets, so I can't necessarily say like, Something is like way more, you know, than another. But um, sunflowers sell really well, especially since we do specialty sunflowers. We don't just do the, the ones you see everywhere. Like we do um, ones called pro cut sunflowers. They're pollenless, one thing, um, and they also come in really cool colors. And so there, we have white sunflowers. We have white sunflowers with really dark centers. We have white sunflowers with yellow centers. We have really red ones. We have multicolored ones. We have ones that are doubles that have multiple petals in them. Those always sell really well. Um, zinnias sell really well because they're big, bright, punchy, bold, and just huge. They kind of look like dahlias. Um, and we are doing dahlias this year, which I imagine will also sell well. Um, you know, people always like the specialty things like the roses or the peonies, things like that, especially that have a good fragrance. Um, they don't last as long in a vase, all of them, but people enjoy those. So honestly, like it just, it just depends on the person. <laughs> Any other questions? Go ahead. Like, do I have like a recipe you mean or? Um, so I kind of use a general formula. You want to do about 30%, well, about a third, about a third focal flowers, which are going to be your big punchy ones, like your, your zinnias, your dahlias, your peonies, your, you know, your ranunculus, your really big punchy flowers, about a third. Then you want to do a third of what's kind of called supporting flowers that are just smaller. Um, and then you want to, you know, and then you want to do about a third that's greenery, filler, you know, things like that. I used basil as a big filler, and but I used a basil that like smelled really good. I used both a lemon basil and like a cinnamon basil, and they really smell like those two things. And so those are just, it's about the ratio I would use. You don't want to do too much focal for a couple reasons, just because A, it's way more expensive, and then B, a bouquet actually looks really weird if you have too many flowers in it. You actually need the filler to balance it out. And so with people growing, I always say, you know, do about 50% flowers and 50% filler is what you're growing, for sure. Any other questions? Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, last question. My first year I made nothing. I was definitely way in the hole last year because we had a lot of infrastructure costs. Um, it would totally depend on what you're growing. And so that's kind of where I, I start talking about where you have to think about your brand and your ideal customer. So for instance, like a flower like ranunculus, so you have to buy it in a corm. And there's some specialty corms that are really expensive for ranunculus or dahlia, same thing. Like one dahlia tuber can cost you 15, 20 bucks. Yeah, and you can save it from year to year and it'll gradually produce more for you from year to year. But I mean, some of those things are really high upfront costs. So if you're gonna be growing high value crops like that, you really probably need to have a plan for selling them to a florist or something where you're gonna get a lot more money per stem. Um, whereas things like, like zinnias and sunflowers, you can buy it for a lot less expensive. So for instance, like snapdragons, you can buy a pack of snapdragons, 250 seeds from Johnny Seeds for maybe 10 bucks, like the really specialty sna snapdragons that are tall for cutting. You can buy for 10 bucks and each snapdragon plant will usually give you around 10 stems. And so, I mean, and then each snapdragon, if I were to sell it to a, a florist, be about $1.50. And so, I mean, if you start looking at it like that, you can see how it really adds up. Um, so in the bouquets, whenever I was constructing a bouquet, I'd have to think, okay, 
well, this is worth about this much money. Like a pro-cut sunflower, that's worth about $2. You know, a zinnia's worth about $1.50. You know, a snapdragon's worth about $1.50. Filler's worth about 75 cents. You know, you have to think about every single stem you're putting in, and so you don't want to be giving them too much. And that's why stuff that's worth a ton of money like ranunculus, I mean, you're going to be, per sum of ranunculus, I mean, you're looking at 3 bucks Per dahlia, you're looking at 4 to $5 per dahlia. Like, it, it's just more expensive. And so you have to kind of think about with your, where are you selling it to, how much are you selling it for, things like that. It's a good question, though. All right, that's time. So thank you, everybody.